Tuesday, the 23rd of November, European equities rolling over, led lower by technology. The countdown to the close starts right now. The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. So equities rolling over into the close here in Europe, 30 minutes to go until the end of trading. Uh, some external factors to the equity market certainly having a meaningful impact. Uh, two sectors in positive territory right now. The one that is leading is energy. Similar story on the other side of the Atlantic. Brent crude up by 2.5%. Equities, though, one story that is going lower. We're also seeing some weakness in European currencies as well. The British pound down by two tenths. Uh, the cable rate now trading at 133.69. Uh, and there you go. European stocks. 600. We're sub 480, 479.54. We're down by 1.22 percent. 29 minutes to go until the close, Alex. Well, we're two and a half hours here into trading in the U.S. And the story is the second day of tech just getting beaten down. We really rolled over within the last 45 minutes. NASDAQ 100 now off by 1.2 percent around the lows of the session. Uh, and that is truly because we're seeing a continued rise in, in yields, real yields or nominal yields. 30-year yield is one of the biggest uh, downdrafts here, up by about three basis points. I also wanted to point out within the S&P, you have some energy stocks leading the way higher. Obviously, tech names are getting beat up, but also Best by a whopping 16% lower, worst performing stock within the S&P. And that's sort of contributing uh, to some heavy trading as the S&P also roll, rolls over uh, along with tech. And just to prove Guy's point, gasoline futures up over 1%. So clearly the S&P are not really helping at the pump today uh, when it comes to oil prices. Well, it held yesterday and the day before and the day before that. The question is what happens tomorrow and the next day and the next day. I think that's the challenge the president's got to figure out. One factor which may weigh on oil prices, Alex, is the rise of COVID in Europe. AstraZeneca certainly front and centre when it comes to this story. The company planning its next steps in its COVID strategy. The CEO, Pascal Sorio, sitting down a little bit earlier on today with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. I think we are at, uh, in, at a different stage uh, in different regions in the world, but we're still not done with the fight against this pandemic. Uh, there's still uh, uh, new waves that are spreading across the world in different places. So vaccinations and boosters are really critical still. And of course, uh, um, social distancing and the use of masks uh, uh, remains critical in some places. Got my booster this morning. Joining us now, Paul Hunter, Norwich Medical School, University of East Anglia professor in medicine. He specializes in medical microbiology. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. Um, just give us your sense of where you are, where, where you think we are. And, I'm, and I, when I say we, I don't mean just the UK. I think the broader European story is, is very germane here. Where we are in the process of COVID reaccelerating as we head into winter. Well, I think... <clears throat> It's, it varies depending on which country around Europe we're talking about. I think much of the wave that we're seeing, in certainly in Western Europe, is essentially part of the same wave that we saw in the UK during the summer, and that we saw particularly high infection rates in the UK. And to a large extent, that has actually provided more immunity in the UK population, and uh, that is now being boosted by... COVID. So I think we are probably the other side of this wave that is currently still on the increase in Europe. But again, even within in continental Europe, it varies. Romania had a very big uh, surge of infections around about September, October, and that has largely now subsided, um, or at least that was the case a few days ago. And, and I think what's driving a lot of this is how immune populations are, and mm -hmm. partly it's vaccine but partly it's also how many infections have they had to date. So countries like Sweden that have had a pretty broad uh, open society through the whole of the pandemic uh, don't seem to be suffering as much as uh, yeah. some other countries that, like Austria and Germany that, right. that have generally kept things under control. Professor, um, are, are we going to see travel restrictions though i appreciate you say it's on a country and country basis so i can't imagine that an open quarter then will make a ton of sense well yes but if if 
what is driving the infection in any individual country is largely down to how many people are immune or not, then all these other social distancing measures, they will have some short-term impact, but ultimately, you know, they're only going to be delaying the inevitable. What we are in a situation where this disease is becoming endemic, and that means pretty much everybody is going to be exposed to this disease pretty regularly for the rest of our lives. And, and once we've got over the first few infections, helped hopefully by vaccine, then ultimately this will just turn into another cause of the common cold, like its predecessors have done. In terms of managing it, are we at the point now where accelerating vaccine programmes are not going to have a meaningful impact in the short term at least? I'd be curious to get your take on what the short term looks like uh, and that actually physical, therefore physical remedies are required. Is that, is that the point we're at in some of the countries you've highlighted? I, th I think so, yeah. Once you, start, once you vaccinate somebody with a booster, it generally takes seven days before you start to see any impact. And, and the maximum impact is about at 14 days after the booster. So, yeah, it will take a few weeks, particularly as you can't get vaccine into everybody on the same day. So, that it, you know, it can take several weeks to roll out vaccine. But well, if what you do is roll out the vaccine to the most vulnerable, the people who are most likely to end up in hospital first, then you can have more of an impact than, than say, if you just offered vaccine to uh, everybody, irrespective of their vulnerability. I mean, you're, you're talking boosters. I think we're still talking first vaccinations. Have you noticed any increase in take up? Uh, not, not obviously at the moment, and certainly not in the UK. There's still people coming forward for their first shots, but not a huge number by any way. Um, and you're quite right. There are a lot of people who haven't been vaccinated. In some countries, such as I think Romania and, and indeed in the UK, what we have is that even unvaccinated people have actually already had the infection and recovered, and that will be providing them with pretty good protection of the same order of, of protection as you would with a primary course of vaccine. So, yeah, it is, uh, it's a very complicated picture, and it varies dramatically from one location to another, and it depends on how many people have actually had the infection already, how many people yep. have had the vaccine, how many people have had both vaccine and the infection, and then the booster coming in on top of that. So it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to predict at the moment. Professor, what I think is alarming a lot of people is the rate of change that we're seeing in some of these countries, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Um, and what is clear is that people are going indoors and as a result of which now we're starting to see this spike coming through. The UK, the, the, the story looked smoother. We've been higher for longer over the summer because people were outside and therefore maybe it was a more manageable process because transmission wasn't as high. What are you expecting to see in terms of the rate of change in some of the continental countries? Do you think it continues at the, the kind of very strong levels we're seeing at the moment? The UK has, has had high cases for a very long time. How quickly do the other countries catch up? Yeah, again, that's very difficult to be certain about. Undoubtedly, any individual epidemic in any individual country will at some point level out and start declining because it will run out of people who are not uh, uh, susceptible and who are still susceptible. And that, again, that varies so much depending on their past history and the vaccination rollout. So predicting it across countries is very difficult. I think with the infectiousness of the Delta variant that we have at the moment and the slightly more infectious Alpha uh, Y 4.2 variant, the Delta Plus variant, I think that, that uh, would not take very long in countries that were still open. But... Uh, as restrictions are imposed, probably quite rightly in most mm -hmm. cases, that will certainly flatten the peak, but it will extend the uh, the the, um, the duration of yeah. the peak. So it is, uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, we're in a pretty uncertain situation for most European countries at the moment. All right, Professor, thanks a lot. Paul Hunter, University of East uh, Angola, Professor in Medicine. Thank you very much for joining us. So coming up, how do investors deal? with those inflation risks. Karen Ward, JP Morgan Asset Management Chief Market Strategist will be giving us her view. Strong PMIs out of Europe in certain countries but those inflation risks remain. This is Bloomberg. In the Eurozone, it's much more nuanced. We've got a good month in November, but 
the data. We've collected those up to the 19th. And since then, we've got more worries about COVID infection rates coming through. It does look like you're going to get more restrictions implemented in, into December, which is going to mean the ECB is probably going to take a, a much more conservative view on the need for, for tapering. There is still a lot of uncertainty about sort of the size and the stringency of uh, the lockdowns that will uh, await us. I don't think uh, myself that it will have an impact on our intention to wind down the uh, pandemic emergency purchase program. That was Klaus Nod, uh, Netherlands Central Bank Governor, speaking earlier to Bloomberg Television. Also today, uh, Bloomberg had a great interview with Isabel Schnabel, a uh, European Central Bank Executive Board member. And she was downplaying the danger that a fourth COVID wave could actually hamper the Eurozone's recovery, saying, quote, most recently we are seeing a rise in COVID-19 infections and some containment measures in parts of the Euro area. But I do not think that this will derail the overall recovery. And Guy, I find that interesting because she's seen as more of a neutral voice for Mr. Not, like yep. we know he's more hawkish. That wasn't necessarily the surprise. She's seen as the neutral one. It's going to be interesting to see how this works its way through, isn't it? Does this start to affect policy? Does it start to have a meaningful impact on the data? I mm -hmm. don't think we're going to know for a while. And as we were just hearing from Paul Hunter, I think the situation highly uncertain in terms of what the trajectory of COVID is going to look like. And more importantly, on the back of that, what policy is going to look like. Karen Wards uh, joining us now, JP Morgan, Morgan Asset Management Chief, EMEA Market Strategist. She's obviously been ruminating on this, I would have thought. Karen, are, are you starting to, to revisit your assumptions about what next year is going to look like, what the next six months are going to look like as a result of the COVID wave that we are now seeing? No, not materially. I think we've been through enough of these waves now to make a good assessment about what is the really critical question, which is, does demand get delayed or does demand get destroyed? If it's delayed, it doesn't really matter as an investor, really, whether that demand happens in December or comes through in February, April, whatever it is, um, or, or is, if it's destroyed, obviously, then that's something that we really need to care about. But we've seen the US, for example, when it had its spike in September, PMIs deteriorated, we got some data which showed that you were having that temporary reaction of people not wanting to go out and spend or you had a shift in spending back towards goods versus services but it is temporary and the second that people are able to get back to normal life they have that income where they weren't able to get out and spend before and then they actually deploy that as soon as they're able so i think it affects the timing the smoothness of the recovery mm -hmm. but i don't think it changes the overall picture okay so if that's the case karen is this a I hate to say it, but a buy the dip then opportunity. And if so, where is it? I think it broadly is, certainly on things like the, the, the stocks that are related to the cyclical recovery. So things like the industrials, uh, consumer discretionary. I think the backdrop into 2022 is really strong. We are firing on multiple engines in Europe now, or well, globally. The consumer balance sheet looks fantastic. They have repaid some debt. They've got record low borrowing costs. They've got pent up savings and had a massive wealth increase. Companies are investing for the first time, many of them in a decade. And now we have government spending as well because we do have these multi-year infrastructure plans. So I think the backdrop to, for demand is very strong. We do have to be cognizant of some pandemic related changes in the market, which could possibly unwind. And that's what we're seeing with the tech story right now. We've got to recognize that this pandemic was fantastic for growth stocks. Not only were their earnings boosted as we all set up home offices and utilized the cloud, et cetera, but the zero interest rate environment and the flat yield curves was the additional boost to that. So as we progress through recovery, as we hear the central banks, question as to how quickly, yep. but at least talk about easing off the accelerator that does, I think, promote this rotation. Karen, the, the thing is, though, that tech stocks and and I'm talking mainly here about the software companies don't have supply chain issues that they have to deal with. The industrial, the value, the cyclical stocks do. And the latest COVID wave may only exacerbate the supply chain issues that we're seeing. We are seeing some evidence of the rolling off. 
But at the moment, it's uncertain how transitory transitory is going to be. We don't know how long these issues are going to last. And you can see them day in, day out with these kinds of companies. When we hear from management, they remain a massive issue. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're right. The cost pressures are intense. I agree with you. I don't think they're going away quickly. China, I don't think, is going to ease up on its zero tolerance policy until after the Winter Olympics. That takes us really towards March. So these bottlenecks aren't going to go away. And you're right. We have to really scan on a company by company basis to see what the vulnerability are to earnings. But on the whole, what we're seeing is companies happily passing it on. And that is because all of their competitors are in the same boat. So they know they're not going to be undercut. So they're all doing the same. So they are actually managing to maintain margins. So it is going to differ by sector. Not every company in every sector is going to be able to do so. But on the whole, it does seem to be that, that you know, this, this inflation is pricing power. Now, that's interesting in itself um, and suggests there is, you know, some legs to the inflation story. But on the whole, I expect companies to do a pretty good job of protecting their margins through this. Hey, Karen, you know, I'm looking at the bond market. And yes, we are uh, high here in the US. 165 is where we print on the 10 year. But it really does feel like the moves in the bond market are coming from Europe. I mean, we're seeing almost a 10 basis point move uh, over in France. Uh, you're seeing uh, bond yield up by seven basis points. Uh, do you sell into this? And at what point do these high yields start to impact in a deeper way, the equity market. It's funny, isn't it, how our perception of yields, high yields yeah. <laughs> these days has changed. True. Um, so, you know, I think, so a couple of things. The European market, as you say, like the Japanese market, is holding global bond yields down. They are anchoring the whole system. So we've got to keep a very close eye on the European story. Is Europe absolutely zero inflation Japanese? Are the ECB never going to get into positive territory? Are they going to be doing QE forever? That's what the market's thinking about right now and thinking maybe it's not quite that extreme. Maybe actually there is enough momentum. Okay, we've got COVID and that's questioning the timing, but maybe the ECB have some appetite this time to try and rein back on some of their stimulus. And we're hearing, you know, some of those noises coming out from them again very gradually i don't think that this is you know i really characterize this as easing off the accelerator nowhere near the break so i don't think it's going to disrupt the recovery i don't think any of the central banks are sending any signs that they're willing to yep. risk being too early but i do think that you know it, it is it, it's signs they're going to take their foot off the accelerator those yields are going to rise and that's going to filter into Good news for some stocks and not such good news for others. Karen, how synchronised is that going to be? Because at the moment it feels like the Fed, the Bank of England on one page, ECB, BOJ on completely different pages. We've got it up at the moment. Um, Euro dollar trading 112.65. Over the last five days, if you were a US investor versus a Euro, Euro, European investor, so the DAX is down by 1.77% over the last five days, for a eurozone investor, it's down by two and a quarter percent for a US investor. The currency is having a meaningful impact. What, what effect is that going to have if we are going to see a diverging central bank story as we enter next year? I don't think we will have a diverging story. I think we have a diverging starting point. So, uh, it, it, you know, we, it's certainly true. I mean, the Bank of England ended its quantitative easing. The Fed has given us a timetable for when it ends, and that's what we're still waiting for from the ECB. So they've all got a different starting point, but the direction of travel for them all is the same, I think. So I don't think, I think the currency is overreacting right now to what's happening on COVID, but that is based on my assumption that this demand is delayed, not destroyed. And, and ultimately, I don't think the ECB are going to be behind the pack in terms of it moving. It's just its starting point is very different. Karen, always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Nice to see you back in the office. Karen Ward of JP Morgan Asset Management. This is Bloomberg.
It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Rishka Gupta. It's one of the most dramatic flexible working policies yet from a finance firm. The UK fintech Atom Bank has moved to a four-day work week. Employees will see their time at work cut by three and a half hours to 34 hours with no change in salary. Atom Bank was the UK's first mobile-based lender. Since the start of the pandemic, the British workforce has become younger, smaller and more female. An analysis by the Resolution Foundation says that about 586,000 people no longer want to work since the coronavirus hit last year. Researchers found that older men dropped out of the workforce, whilst women have benefited from remote working. In London, a Goldman Sachs analyst has become one of the biggest stars of the financial district. Crystal Pereira has a talent for making cakes, pastries and pies. That's earned the 26-year-old a spot in the final of The Great British Bake Off. That's a reality TV show known in the U.S. as The Great British Baking Show. The show reaches its conclusion this week. Pereira's success has made her one of the best-known faces in the city of London. And that is your latest Business Flash, Alex. I love this story. First of all, I love The Great British Baking Show guy, which is what it's called here in the U.S. I did stop watching Why? after Mary Barra left because I just I loved her Barry, so much. Barry, Barry. Barry. What did I say? Uh, uh, something else. Oh, great. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> the guy's planning is, is so fantastic. Um, but anyway, I love this show so much. And the reason yeah. why is because it's so much better than all the reality shows here in the U.S., particularly when, when it comes to baking, because it, they're all, like, supportive and they like each other and they're all encouraging each other, and I love it, and I'm so excited to see this. Apart from Hollywood, who obviously has a different attitude to all of those things. But he um, shook her hand. Yeah, I hope she He shook her hand. He, he does not yeah. do that, and he shook her hand. That no. is amazing. Yeah, that, I, that was obviously a highlight. Jürgen going out. I've not been following it as closely as I probably should. I watched some of the early episodes. I seem to have lost track a little bit. But Jürgen going out. I was expecting that to happen. I, I'm, what I'm really looking ah. forward to is your participation <laughs> in this process. Alex oh, Steele talks a amazing. really good game on baking, icing, and croissants. Just going to point that one out. So I made this for our line producer, Nicole, for her bridal shower. Um, it's a, she loves Disney, so it's a castle molding cake. You should have seen what I did for my daughter's birthday. Is that birthday. what it is? That was, that, was, that was three tiers. There was a zebra, there was a lion, there was a tiger. That was a whole thing. We're not talking croissants here, though. Because my husband messed it up. I can't hear you. They're talking in my ear. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs>So we're wrapping up the trading session here in Europe. Actually, a fairly mixed day. It's really sector-specific, and that's having a huge impact on individual markets. On the continent, the main markets are certainly down uh, and have been he heading lower. The DAX, for instance, is down by almost a full 1%. The CAC down by 7 tenths of 1%. The Italian market is down by nearly 1.5%. The SMI down by around 1%. But look at what is happening in London, uh, which is commodity-heavy, and as a result of which, we are seeing miners having a good day and as a result of which the London market is having a fairly good day as well. So that's the kind of the, the top-down picture. That's the broad brush story. I'll get into the kind of bottom-up, more granular approach in just a moment. In, in terms of the way that the session has evolved, actually, I don't think there's nothing really much to really take home here. Tech's been certainly weighed down today. We saw that really being transferred out of the US session yesterday, the back end of it. Uh, and I think we just priced that in first thing this morning. We've just drifted sideways uh, into Thanksgiving, effectively, uh, which for some people starts tomorrow. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the GRR picture, just to give you an idea of what the sector breakdown looks like, unsurprisingly, energy is the lead gainer. The basic resources sector is the miners, also up. That's, that's the London story. Down at the bottom, technology's down. Think about sort of the big tech st stocks that are listed in places like Germany. Financial services are down, the industrials are down, the healthcare sector is down. That's really suppressing some of the continental markets. There are, though, I think, kind of individual bottom-up, stock stories which i think are really fascinating pets at home i keep kind of comparing and contrast pets and home and peloton probably not something you do on a daily basis but basically people during lockdown went out and bought pelotons and pets <laughs> now you can park the peloton and do nothing with it 
you've got to feed the dog, the cat, or whatever else you bought. And as a result of which, actually, despite some supply chain issues, actually, we are seeing some very good numbers continuing to be posted by Pets at Home. So that's one stay-at-home stock uh, that actually continues to do very well. Shaw Capital out with a really positive note on a little bit earlier on. Henners and Marich has been a really interesting story. Quite bumpy for a while. We're seeing the family buying in. That's being taken as a hugely positive sign today. The stock up by 5.4%. But then we come to another stock that is in the retail space, which is really suffered as a result of the supply chain story that we're seeing. AO World is a white goods distributor, um, fridges, cookers, etc. And what it's been seeing is, A, people bought a lot of that stuff during lockdown, and B, supply chain problems, driver shortages, etc. Meaning as they go into the holiday season, they're not able to deliver and get hold of what they want. And as a result of which, we saw a guidance downgrade today. The market really marking the stock heavily, heavily to the downside. It was off much more than that earlier. But it's finishing up kind of circa down 14%, Alex. All right, look, let's get to the what point you were making about the miners, because that's really helping uh, the FTSE 100 as well. So you have that bounce in iron ore uh, over in China. That really helped Rio Tinto, BHP. Um, the idea is that we're seeing growing optimism that the easing property market curbs in China will lift demand. Also, if you have some steel restrictions lifted off, that's going to help iron ore, which is an input to steel. Uh, Eddie Vandervald, uh, Bloomberg's metals and commodities correspondent, uh, joins us now. Although I just have to say that they had an entire conversation about banking uh, in, in the commercial break, to which I could <laughs> not participate and I was uh, it was awesome it was very nice uh, anyway <laughs> what's up with the miners have they finally bottomed yeah. in terms of prices See, now I want to go back to the to the banking and talk about that. But listen, um, no, the, the miners, we're really seeing a, that bounce, as you say, on the back of this iron ore move. You know, if China, if we see any sort of any sort of stimulus in China, that will definitely help iron ore prices. And it will help, you know, the miners. The miners like to talk about their green credentials. They like to talk about uh, commodities like copper and so on. But a lot of the big names are very dependent on iron ore and very dependent on coal. So when you see these yeah. uh, legacy commodities doing well, you know, your BHPs, your Glencores, all of those companies tend to do really well out of that. And I think that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing, you know, this is their stock and trade. Yes, they've got their copper for the future. But at the moment, you know, their bread and butter is still a, in a lot of cases iron ore. Uh, can I just say that I think Alex missed out on a massive opportunity there because as you would have heard from the conversation that took place in the break, Eddie and his wife made a Minecraft cake. That was the Minecraft. connection. Eddie and his wife. Digging stuff Eddie out of the and ground. his wife Eddie, made a Minecraft Eddie, okay. cake. Eddie's no, wife no, no, made no. a Minecraft Eddie, cake. Eddie's, Eddie's wife is going to watch this clip in a bit, and, and, and I don't want her to. <laughs> she's going to come down on me hard. She made the Minecraft but, but, cake. I okay. ate the cutoffs. Yeah, I, I ate the cutoffs. Okay. That was my contribution. <laughs> because you had round, because you had rounds uh, uh, in round which cake, you had yeah, to work had with. Square. There's nothing right. There's nothing round in Minecraft. <laughs> Um, but that was the connection. <laughs> that was that was how you could have linked from one to the other. And, My hey, children that's do it. True. We could have. Because why? Yeah. How? I don't. Wait, a video game to to cake? Minecraft. Huh? Minecraft. Oh. We're talking about like miners. Mine. Eddie's cake was a Minecraft yeah, cake. If you want to do anything in Minecraft, you have to dig stuff out of the ground. Oh, well, in order this, to make this is it a fair work. Point. Hence the name of the game. I've never <laughs> actually played Minecraft, so I don't actually know. I just assumed you just build stuff with blocks. Uh, that that was you got to go thing. mine your iron ore, and then you got to smelt it, and then you get your your blocks out of which yep. you can build. You so, smelt no, it's, the metal? It's, it's, you smelt the metal uh, in, my, in Minecraft? Yeah. Oh, this changes the game And you can make alloys me. and all kinds of things. <laughs> That is pretty um, cool. Anyway, we, we, we digress. Somehow this Great British Bake Off, or whatever you call it over there, <laughs> seems to have uh, found awesome. its way into this conversation as well. Um, Eddie, the, the other factor that I think is worth bearing in mind is that there is the possibility that, A, the credit story in China is going to become easier, and also it looks like some of the restrictions on the construction sector may be being eased up. Yeah, yeah. So, so look, uh, and, and, and this has been part of the problem for, for, for you know, if, if, if China is not building... So much of steel still goes into construction in China. Um, and, and a lot of the other commodities are also very exposed to this, whether we're talking about coking coal, whether we're talking about, um, you know, zinc or nickel, all very exposed to the Chinese um, construction sector. So if we see more support there, that will be very, very positive for these commodities and for the miners that produce them. Uh, so, Eddie, does it matter then necessarily what happens to Chinese growth? Like, how correlated are we going to be with those numbers now? You know, there was a, there was a, 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 a stage a couple of years ago where Chinese um, stimulus moved away from the construction and from, uh, from heavy industry, and they, they were trying to support their consumers a lot more. 
And I think it's really interesting to see that they are now moving back towards not the heavy industry so much, but but supporting the, the, the construction industry, because I think that is very positive for a lot of the, 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 the bigger, um, more diversified miners like your BHPs, your Anglos and so on. Um, and it is also, you know, it's, it's, it's just interesting to see that, sh that China is shifting back that way um, because it, it definitely will help those commodity prices. Eddie, just before I let you go, can I just get your take on gold right now? I, I would have thought this would be the perfect environment. I, yeah, exactly. The sharp you intake would. of breath. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's not happening. Why not? Gold is struggling. Gold is struggling. And, and, and you know, I think, I think the narrative for gold, gold was ahead of the narrative, you know, on, on the worries over inflation and so on at the end of last year. But ever since then, we've seen the ETFs starting to sell off. And ETFs, even on up days, we're not seeing a lot of inflows into ETFs. ETFs sit on 3,000 tons of gold at the moment, which is more than a year's worth of mine supply. So if we see more of that ETF... Um, the holdings come back into the market. That is a very negative environment for gold to be in. Hmm. OK, Eddie, great stuff with the cake. I'm sure your wife was uh, uh, was very impressed by your ability to help. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll park that for another day. But Picture, yeah, we, yeah, I think I, I was about to say, I think some evidence <laughs> next time. It. I'll send yeah. it. Thank you. Eddie, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Eddie van der Volt joining us on what's happening with the mining sector right now. Let's talk about where European stocks have finished as we head into the break. Uh, the auction done, the FTSE 100 just dipping a little bit uh, as the auction progressed, uh, but we're still positive. The DAX down by 1.1%, the Kakarot down by 8 tenths of 1%. So even further selling into the close here, Alex. All right, well, coming up, we still have a lot to dis dissect when it comes to European gas prices. They're on the rise again. We're going to be looking at what's driving those gains next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets, the European close. I'm Rishka Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room coming up. The U.S. Senator Pat Toomey, that's at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Ritka Gupta. In Germany, Berlin is imposing wide-ranging restrictions aimed at curbing the latest COVID surge. Adults who are neither vaccinated nor recovered from the coronavirus are banned from a number of places, amongst them non-essential stores and hotels. For those who are vaccinated, they still need to wear masks at restaurants and salons and have to be tested to go to places like nightclubs. The committee in the European Parliament writing tech rules has passed measures that could affect major U.S. and European tech companies. Competing messaging apps may have to be interoperable to prevent people from being forced to use one or the other because that's where their friends are. Plus, companies would have to stop targeting some ads to minors. The EU's tech rules are expected to come into force next year. And there's never been a coordinated attempt like this to bring down oil prices. The U.S. will release 50 million barrels of crude from its strategic petroleum reserve. China, Japan, India and South Korea will also release some of their stockpiles. The decision to collective discharge stored oil came after OPEC and its allies rebuffed those calls to significantly boost production. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gipta. This is Bloomberg. Alex. All right. Thanks so much, Riddick. I appreciate that. So uh, let's stay on that story for a second because gas prices are soaring in Europe. Uh, yes, you have some sanctions, U.S. sanctions on Russia, which affects the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, but you also have countries joining together to release some oil from reserves. So how does that track when it comes to gas prices? Uh, Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison uh, joins us now. So you have this coordinated effect to release oil from the SPRs. Does this have any material effect on, um, on natural gas prices? Yes, we've seen some strength in natural gas prices today coming from the move in oil prices. And as you mentioned, it's also been supported by some sanctions from the US. Although really, with Nord Stream 2, the uh, gas pipeline project, it feels like another week, another controversy. So we are hearing mainly that these sanctions probably won't have that much of a material impact, given that the pipeline has been built. But 
the story rolls on. We saw last week Germany withholding some regulatory approvals for the pipeline. So as it stands, the pipes are built, ready, full of gas, but it rolls on to see what when they will actually be supplying gas from Russia to Europe. And these US sanctions relate to a ship that um, was supposedly doing some work around yep. the pipe, but it's uh, not clear exactly what the impact the re in the real term impact will be. Rachel, one of the things we're having to deal with on almost a daily basis at the moment is huge moves in the price of gas, incredible volatility. Uh, it continues to cause huge problems for the, for the power company, certainly here in the UK and elsewhere. Is there any sign that this volatility is going to be abating anytime soon? Like 10% moves on a daily basis. That's really hard to manage. Yes, so much of what's happening in the market at the moment is sentiment driven. So really, when you drill into the fundamentals, these some of these things like the sanctions don't make a huge amount of difference to to what's actually happening to flows of gas. And that can infuriate analysts, but it doesn't stop it moving prices. So last week we saw huge volatility. And you're right, these kind of uh, intraday moves are not a kind of regular occurrence, usually, even in winter. So traders are just having to get used to these enormous moves and prepare as best they can um, to be on the right side of whichever way the market is going to move on news and breaking news events happening. So, uh, Rachel, to all of these points, um, we learned that the uh, UK is going to nationalize, right, a power company, right, 1.7 uh, million users. How unusual uh, is this step? And kind of can you describe what's happening there? Yes, this, uh, you're referring to Bulb, which is the seventh biggest energy supplier in the UK. And it really is the biggest supplier to fail. We've seen 20 before them. And this is really significant because for the first time, the government are stepping in to try to smooth the administration process. So they will help uh, take on the customers of Bulb and pay for that so that it doesn't cause market chaos. And we understand that in fact, the huge volatility on the gas market last week was really the final straw in negotiations for Bulb in reaching financing. And that's when they decided they couldn't um, stand the volatility any longer and they would have to go into administration. Rachel, it's going to get cold over the next few days. Um, when are we going to start really getting an understanding about whether or not Europe has enough gas for the winter? I, it's, it's going to get cold. There's a forecast of a bit of snow. We're, we're getting into the beginning of December where do we stand in terms of inventory? Where do we stand in terms of supplies that are going to get through this winter? Yes, as we've been uh, saying in the weeks leading up to this, cold weather is really is what's going to test this situation. So we have the beginning of that. It's starting to get cold. You know, nothing really unusual, but that's when we start to use stores of gas. And the more we use earlier on in the season, the less we have for later on. And traders are always worried about a cold snap in February, in early March, when we've used up all of the stocks. And this year, that looks more likely to happen than, than it has in the past. And so that's what's really driving the high prices, because people are looking to the end of winter and thinking, what if we don't have enough gas? We have had people speculating that could happen. And as it starts to get colder, as demand increases and we start to use more gas, we'll really start to see how quickly those inventories start mm -hmm. to fall. Yeah, exactly. And I wonder sort of the knock on effect then to something like coal. Maybe it's a touch different in the UK, but in Europe, at least carbon prices are high because coal is having to be used because of this. Yes, when gas prices are high, it makes coal more economic. So even though we've had COP26, we've all been talking about how we need to get off coal in these kind of crunch situations. Coal is available and it is being used, especially when gas prices are so high. And that is having an impact on carbon prices. We've seen a record reached on several days um, already this week. So it uh, seems to be bullish movements across all of the energy prices. And the cold weather is only making it worse. Rachel, always appreciate the update. Thank you very much indeed. Rachel Morrison on what's happening with the energy story here in Europe. This is Bloomberg.
So a bit of a bumpy session stateside. Uh, US investors, I think, all of us really trying to figure out what PAL 2.0 really means for markets. Abigail Doolittle here with the price action. Well, Guy, bumpy indeed. And here are some of the biggest laggards on the day, really taking big, big headlines. Take a look at Best Buy down 15%. Now, super interesting here, there's this sensational headline about increased theft really biting into the gross margin, but it's only by a tiny degree more likely for this big fall. The stock had been up about 40% into this report over the last less than two months. So investors taking chips off the table in a big way. Urban Outfitters, the worst day since March of 2020. Mixed quarter, supply chain really eating results there and zoom worst day ever in its young life going back to 2019 down about 19 percent this of course on growth concerns around the pandemic perhaps not helping out zoom maybe we've seen peak zoom but what is really weighing on the market it's all about big tech as you guys have been talking about the prospect of rising rates not helping out these big technology shares microsoft nvidia tesla alphabet of course has to do with valuation it makes them look uh, richer and if we are going to see this fed uh, perhaps perhaps continue the normalization process and rates move up ahead of that, that again could be a real headwind for big tech. However, let's take a look at what rising rates do help, and that's all about the banks. Take a look at Bank of America and J.P. Morgan up more than 2%, and you were just all talking uh, with Rachel Morrison about energy, oil up in a big way. That's helping out the big oil names. So it's not all bad today. It's a really mixed picture. Growth down, value up, Alex. All right, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Abigail Doolittle joining us there. And again, real yields uh, moving less negative, if we can say that. All right, um, here's the next 24 hours and what we're watching. My Thanksgiving starts at 3.01 today, but if you're here with Guy tomorrow, this is what you can look forward to. So President Biden later on today actually is going to speak at 2 p.m. on his decision uh, to release oil reserves. We'll watch that. Uh, plus, you get a seven-year auction, $59 billion. The two and the five was really, really soggy. Uh, not a lot of take-up demand, so watch that. Plus, after the bell, earnings from Gap, Dell, and Nordstrom's. I'm really interested in Gap, Guy, after we had um, uh, Victoria's Secret actually surprise the upside, as well as Macy's. I'm interested to see what uh, Gap does. So what are you doing tomorrow? Are you shopping? Are you baking? Oh, we can't talk about baking anymore. No, we can't. We're done with, make, we're done with baking. No, uh, I, I'm going to be baking and cooking pretty much all day tomorrow. I have so my you are grocery. So you are going to be baking? Yes, I, I am. I look for, I, I'm sure that you will be sending us pictures. But if I have questions, to, I'll be to, sure to ask you. Is that Well, that you work? should. Honestly, <laughs> square tins versus round tins. This is where I feel like I have, I have something to add. <laughs> I, I, Decorating, I, I not you. so much. Fair enough. I, I, honestly, I think we need pictures tomorrow. I will make sure that they make it to air. We'll just, is it pumpkin pie? What do you guys eat at this time of year? I can't remember. No, well, I mean, I'm trying to not go crazy because no one necessarily eats all the food. But I've already done my bread baking. I've done my snack and dough. I've done my croissants. I now have to just, like, put it all together and then make a pecan pie and make a soup. That, that, that's my tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Make sure you, just make sure you don't overglaze the, the croissants. It's such a good we'll point, Guy. Thank you so much for telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's a backstory here. Uh, what you else do we get now. tomorrow? You're doing something tomorrow. U.S. jobless claims, uh, GDP we get data tomorrow. We get U.S. home sales. Basically, we're getting a data dump in advance of Thanksgiving. University of Michigan consumer sentiment data. Deer, I think, is going to be interesting post the strike. Uh, we'll certainly talk a lot about that tomorrow. And the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has a rate decision down under. We'll factor that into our, our conversations tomorrow. But mainly, it's going to center around baking. It is, but I won't be here. You'll just be talking to yourself, basically. Uh, but actually, I am interested in deer, as you were mentioning, after the, uh, the, the union um, uh, wage with 10%, right, and signing bonus, <laughs> and then they're going to increase about yeah. 3%, 5% in the next few years. Like, I'm interested to see what the commentary is on that. Well, maybe what we should be discussing, actually, which would be more useful, would be a how, is, how much more expensive is Thanksgiving this year? Talking of deer, food prices have been going up. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of big conversation certainly happening on the MLive blog about how food prices are going to be mm -hmm. the story for next year. So this could, be, uh, this could be a cheap Thanksgiving compared with next Thanksgiving. If food price, uh, basically, the, the, the line is that this year we talked about energy prices going up. Next year it's going to be food prices because one translates into the other. Yeah, I just hope that I get my bird this year. Last year I paid for it and they didn't give it to me. So I'm really hoping that this year that I just actually get some kind of turkey. Um, all right, that wraps up for me and Guy. Happy Thanksgiving from me. Uh, Guy will be here for the rest of the week for you. Uh, Richard Haas is coming up next to Council of Foreign Relations. President will be joining at Balance of Power with David Weston on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Guy and I will be going to rib each other over on radio. Check us out on the cable. This is Bloomberg.